Good morning, church. Can we all rise to our feet? It's always a joy to be in the house of the Lord. So before we move into a time of worship, there was just this, this verse that I was meditating on. It's from Isaiah 40, verse 6. You don't have to turn there, but if you want to, feel free to do so. But you can just listen to what I have to say. You can just listen to what I'm going to read. And this is what it says. This is God sending comfort to his people, Israel. And this is what he says. And a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry out? Isaiah saying, what should I cry out? And this is what God is saying. All men are like grass. And all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Because the breath of the Lord blows on them. All men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You know, the KJV version says, I'm going to read that as well because it's so beautiful. So this is what it says. <clears throat> All flesh is grass and all the goodliness. Some versions say the faithfulness. So it says like all, so our, the goodliness of man, the faithfulness of man that can fade away. But it says surely his word will not. His word it will not. And you know what the word, I was thinking about, what is this word? Of course that's God's word word spoken word and I'm and I just realized wow that spoken word is the word that became flesh and that's Jesus himself Jesus himself the word that became flesh that will stand forever men are like grass we may be here today we may not be here tomorrow we can we can our glory, our, our faithfulness, some versions say faithfulness, our goodliness. It may be here today when everything is going well. Our goodliness may be going well. Our faithfulness will be going well. But then sometimes it's not. We fail, we falter. But the assurance is that the word of God stands firm. And that word is Jesus himself. The verses that follow talks about Jesus himself coming with his reward and that's our promise. He's coming with his reward. Our faithfulness can, can waver. But our promise is that God remains the same. He endures forever. Father, we, we thank you for this time. And we pray that you will take glory in our midst, Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will come and comfort us. We pray that if anyone is here that needs comfort, you will speak straight into their lives and reassure them that your word endures forever. All the beauty in this world, all the glory in this world may fade, but your word remains forever. Your word stands and will not be shaken. Jesus, you will not be shaken. And because you will not be shaken, we will not be shaken. Amen. We will not be shaken, God, because you reign. 
you defeated death you conquered sin and today you are exalted and you are seated on that throne and we've come to serve a living god we've come to worship a living god and that's why we're here our god is not dead but our god is seated on the throne and he is there because he was victorious Lord we're here to say blessed blessed be your name Jesus blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful blessed be your name even if i walk through the valleys and i have nothing in the desert place but still i will say blessed be your name because lord you are on that throne and you reign You know Ben was saying just the other day he was telling me from the book of Job what Job told his wife If you can accept all that God gives all the good things that God gives will you not accept even the bad that he allows Oh my goodness that moved my heart Lord that we will stand here and say blessed be your name no matter what blessed be your name Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be See that every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise when the darkness closes in. Lord, still sing it. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name. Blessed be 
church will always bless your name oh we'll always bless your name we bless your holy Give us strength, oh God. Give us strength to keep coming back to you. To keep coming back to you, oh God. Because not for a moment will you forsake us.
of all look to you God and you give them food at their proper time you give them food at the right time at the proper time you open up your hands and satisfy the desires of every living thing he is faithful to his promises we have seen that time and again that he is faithful to his promises you may be feeling that you're faithless but he says even if you are faithful faithless he is faithful to his promises he upholds those who fall and he lifts up those who are bowed down satisfies the desires of every living thing. And you know what is the only thing that can satisfy? It's Him. Nothing else will satisfy. Jesus, nothing else will satisfy us today. Even even if we've been coming to you time and again Lord we know that nothing else can satisfy but you Jesus nothing else will be enough but you Jesus no promise nothing no wealth no gold no silver no diamonds no riches no inheritance will satisfy but him alone so that we can rest 
in you. Sing it out. Because Jesus said, what is impossible with man 
is possible with God. It is possible with you alone, Jesus. Lord, we will bring these salvations. We will bring these promises, the wealth of promises that you have spoken into our lives. And we will say, Jesus, it is a yes and an amen in you. And we will find rest in you. We will find confidence in you. Lord, we will take strength. we're always just saying things we're all always just just singing things we're just singing we're singing but take this time in your own quiet space to say Lord I laid all down before you what have you been praying for what have you been asking for
Lord, we just thank you for this time, Lord. Speak to us this morning, God. We thank you for your presence, God. We thank you that you always show up, Lord. We lay our lives at the feet of Jesus, a God who holds today and tomorrow. We take confidence in that, God. We take confidence in that. We just commit the rest of this time into your hands. We pray that you will take glory in this place. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, well, greetings to you in Jesus' name. And uh, this morning, the title of my message is Taking the Yoke of Jesus. And uh, we will read uh, the most familiar verse in the New Testament. It's from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what do you mean by being yoked with Christ? You know what a yoke is, right? A yoke is that long wooden piece that fastens two animals together, right? Uh, to do the work. So that is yoke. So when I say that you're being yoked with Christ, it means that we are fastened with Jesus. Our life is united with Christ. We are one with Christ. We are united um, our life with this life, our will with this will, our heart with this heart. So to be yoked with Jesus is to be one with Jesus in a relationship of love, trust and obedience. Okay, so that's what exactly what I mean when I say being yoked with Christ. But we come back to this verse, you know, it's a very familiar verse, the most popular verse in the New Testament. I'm sure most of us know this by heart. So when Jesus says, come unto me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. You can actually uh, picturize, you can actually imagine, you know, Jesus with his arms wide open, right? And telling us just come, come to me. And it's a call, it's an invitation, it's an open invitation, it's a, it's a universal you know, solution to all our problems. He's saying, all who are weary, if you're heavy laden, if you're burdened, just come. You know, irrespective of caste, color, and creed. Jesus brings down all those defenses, those barriers, and he makes an open clarion call to all of us, respective of who you are. And he says, come. You know, if you're weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what it means, right? So, I'm sure all of us have experienced this rest. Have had, have experienced the reality of this verse. Coming to Jesus with all our burdens, being heavy laden, being weary, and is trading it off, trading all our sorrows and burdens, and experience the rest that only Jesus can give. Right? All of us have experienced that in some way or the other. Right? That's why it's such a beautiful verse. And not only that, every time when you come into his presence. Every time when you come to his presence, you experience that rest. This rest is not just a hallowed feeling that comes upon you when you step into the church. You know, it's, it's the repose of a heart that is set deep in God. Right? It's when your heart is positioned, you know, in a place where you find your total peace and tranquility and comfort in Jesus. And it happens when you come to him, not when you come to church. You can come to church, you can be seated here, you can go through the motions of worship, you can listen to a sermon, but it doesn't touch you unless you come to Jesus. Unless you make a conscious effort to draw near to his presence and when he touches you, you feel that rest coming upon you, right? And we all experience that and you experience that even today when you come into his presence. It's so real. It's very real. But that's not my sermon. Of course, it's an invitation that Jesus gives us and become an experience, it doesn't end there. It doesn't just cause us to come 
you know, and experiences rest. But it continues. He says, come and take my yoke upon you and learn from me. There's another invitation for us. There's an, another invitation for you and me to come and learn from Jesus. He's saying, come and learn from me. So if you see in the Bible, we, we feel that, you know, there are multitudes that Jesus, you know, invited. There are so many thousands of them who came to Jesus. We come to Jesus for various reasons. You know, we come and experience his healing. We come and experience deliverance. We come and experience, of course, the peace and the joy that he gives, the comfort that he needs, that we need. We experience all of that. We experience, of course, the, the rest that God gives. But that's not what he invites us for. Of course, he does all of that, but he also invites us to come and learn from him. He says, come and learn. Come and learn. So we take a good look at Jesus to learn from him. Get a closer look at Jesus. What is he inviting us for? What do we learn from? Why do we learn from Jesus? Why do we learn from Jesus? Because he's a perfect role model, right? Today we make a mistake of trying to look at, you know, people. You know, we try to always look at people, try to consider people as our role models, people try to hero worship them, sometimes we are offended in our Christian faith because we probably considered some servant of God as the ultimate role model and then, you know, he falls short of God's expectation. That really shakes our faith. Some of us even, you know, to the extent we lose our trust in God because the people whom we have trusted have failed us miserably. It's a sad comparison. We should not compare ourselves, we should not look at people. We should look at Jesus. We should look at Jesus. Uh, take a good, close look at Jesus and see him and observe him and carefully study him and learn from him. Why? Because he is a perfect role model. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfect of our faith. Last week you heard a sermon, right? In Hebrews chapter 11, we have this whole hall of fame, the great men of God. You know, by faith Noah built an ark, by faith Enoch walked with God, by faith Abraham left and went ahead to a, to a land that he did not know where he was going. So we read about all those great men of God. But finally, the whole list culminates to a point that Hebrews 12, the author says, but looking unto Jesus. We have so many examples today in this world. But he says, but you look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, because he's our perfect role model. He's our numero uno, you know. He's our superstar. He's our number one. He's the one, the author and the finisher of our faith. We learn faith from Jesus. He's the one who influences our life. So why should we learn from Jesus? Because he's our perfect role model. You, you stop looking at people and you start looking at Jesus Take a good look at Jesus. I tell you, your life is bound to be transformed because he's the perfect one. But what do we learn from Jesus? He's inviting us and he says, come and learn from me. So what should we learn from Jesus? We learn to be one with Jesus. We learn obedience. We learn to understand God's plan for our lives. We learn the beauty of his character. We learn gentleness. We learn kindness. We learn patience. We, know, we learn all the plans that he has for, us, for your life and my life. It's a journey of walking with Jesus. It's a journey of discovery. He's yoked himself with you. You're part of his life. He's partners with you. And as you walk in this journey with Jesus, we learn to obey him. We learn to understand what God is telling us. We learn to understand slowly, gradually, we begin to understand what is the real calling upon my life? What is God trying to do with my life? Why has he chosen me? What is his purpose concerning? How he wants me to change? What are the things that he expects from me? You're being united with Jesus. You're learning to be one with Jesus. That's the ultimate goal of God calling us. Saying, come, come. And learn from me. So we are in this journey of getting to learn from Jesus, people of God. You know, sometimes in our Christian life, uh, things have become very superficial. We miss out on the, the most spiritual aspect of, of God. 
it happened in the church you know at some point of time in the early church they begin to you know um fight about you know squirmish about the appearance of jesus you know, sometimes you really wonder what draws people to jesus you know, what has attracted us to jesus why why those so many multitudes of people came after jesus you know we might be it might be you know it might be a shallow understanding or we might be short sighted if we think only the miracles that jesus did drew those thousands of people no it was the beauty of his personality of who jesus was the beauty of his character of who he was the love and the compassion that emulated out of his life they knew that jesus was somebody so different when he spoke they knew that he spoke the word of god they knew that this word has such authority and power it was god it was not just because you know there was healings and miracles and people just experienced and received all the things that they wanted no there's something more the early church began to squirmish about you know how jesus really looked some of them some christians believe that jesus was a young handsome classic you know young man that's how he looked and uh, and then the gnostics came forward and said no 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 he didn't have a, any appearance you know jesus you know you look remember when he was walking in the road to emmaus people couldn't recognize him so he had the ability to change his appearance so jesus never had a real body and the church fathers got very angry you know they said they are theologically very sound they said no 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 that's not the truth jesus had a real body and his appearance was not desirable so they said you read isaiah chapter 53 verse 2 it says that you know he had no beauty there was no form in him there was no majesty in him you know nobody could desire him that's the way he was because he was broken and bruised they said jesus appearance was not all that great he was pretty ordinary and nobody could desire him and then the pagans came and celsius said oh our christians have ugly god and again the church fathers became very angry no 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 we we need to retract our statement you know that's not what that's not how jesus looked no he was perfect in beauty that's a jesus was perfect in in his body you know and he looked beautiful augustine of hippo said no jesus looked perfect in beauty you know in his appearance and that's how the western is that's how the protestant art came into existence it evolved right you have this perfect you know picture perfect jesus looking like a european you know a white jesus depicted you know you have the sacred heart beautiful perfectly trimmed beard and a long hair and white complexion and the catholics you know took it even more you know farther they said no we will have an image most of the europeans are christian so they said we will have a white jesus and then christianity came into china and they said we will have a chinese jesus and it went to ethiopia they said we'll have a black jesus <laughs> we can fight about the appearance of jesus what draws us to jesus what attracts you to jesus you tell me what attracts you to jesus i tell you it's the personality of jesus it's the beauty of his character it's of who jesus is when you meet him when you meet jesus you know that it is who he is so what do we learn from jesus we learn to be one with jesus so we come back to that verse matthew chapter 11 verse 28 says come unto me all who are weary and burdened and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me now listen to what jesus says how can we learn from jesus the bible says take my yoke upon you and learn from me the only way you can learn what god wants to do in your life i repeat it the only way you can learn and understand what jesus is trying to do in your life is when you take his yoke upon you unless you're willing to take the yoke upon you you will never learn from jesus you will never learn what god wants to do in your life you understand what i'm trying to say unless you're willing to submit yourself to take the yoke upon your lives you will never be able to learn what god is doing in your lives 
Because that's what the Bible says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. It's very direct. You, it's you. It's not your spouse. They have a specific yoke designed for them. But it's you. It's very specific. It's very straightforward. It's point blank. It's direct. It's explicit. It's you. Jesus is saying, unless you are willing to, unless you are willing to come under that yoke, unless you are willing to submit to that yoke, unless you are willing to take that yoke upon you, you will never learn. Sometimes we are so disillusioned about what God is trying to do in my life. I can't figure it out. I don't, I don't understand what is going on. He's saying, learn. I'm trying to teach you. I'm trying to teach you the eternal way of life. I'm trying to teach you the plans that I have for you. But you need to learn from me. Walk closer to me and learn from me. You know what a yoke is, right? I've told you what a yoke is. A yoke is that long piece of wood that is fixed across the necks of two animals so that they can pull loads when they walk together, right? So a yoke is something, you can see it fastens on your neck. A yoke is something that is fastened. It's pressed hard against the neck of the animal. So it's, it's carrying a huge weight and it, and it takes that yoke. It pulls that weight because of that yoke. So a yoke is something that presses you hard. In simple terms, a yoke is something that burdens you, that weighs you down. Sometimes it gives you pain. You are weighed under that burden, right? And Jesus said, that's good for you. It's good for you. Take that yoke upon you because it's good for you. Because when you take that yoke upon you, that's when you begin to learn what I'm trying to do in your life. You tell me. Most of you here, most of you, yes, we have come to Jesus. Yes, we've experienced that rest. Yes, we have come, we come with our heavy burdens. We have laid it at the feet of Jesus. Yes, we are changed and transformed. But don't you carry a burden in your heart today? Most of you. Most of you carry some kind of a burden in your heart. Something that weighs you down, isn't it? That's why we have so many prayer requests, list as long as an arm, right? We are praying for people's healing. We are praying for the financial problems. We are praying for your career, uh, you know, breakthroughs. So, so many lists we are... We can't exhaust it. We are going and saying, we stop, we'll stop, we'll continue it next, next day, right? We are so many because something or the other is bothering you. Something is weighing you down, right? Something hurts you. Something causes you pain. Even after coming to Jesus, right? How many these grace preachers, you know, what they preach. When you come to Jesus, all oh, there's no suffering, no problems. Nonsense. Who said that? Absolute nonsense. There's no problems for you. They mock at people when they say, you know, you go through suffering, you go through problems, even after coming to Jesus. But that's what the Bible says. A yoke is something that presses you very hard. I know people who come and told me, you know, when I came to Jesus, nobody told me that I have problems. I know a guy always who say that, you know, Ganesh, he, became, he was a Hindu, he came to Jesus and he said, man, when I was, when I was out in the world, they, all they said was, come to Jesus, you know, all your problems will be solved. Jesus, they gave me so many promises. Now I come to Jesus, man, I have so many problems. Nobody told me if I come to Jesus, I will have problems. You will have problems. You will have problems. It would be utter dishonesty to tell you, if you come to Jesus... You will have no problems and your life will be a bowl of cherries. So it's confusing, right? Sometimes you really wonder. It's confusing, right? What is this? What are you talking to me? What are you preaching? He said, Jesus said, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And you he say, he's asking us to come to him that he will, you know, unload our burdens, unload our weights and he will give us rest. And you're now telling us he will give us another burden. I'll tell you what. Understand this. This is the good news. The yoke that you are carrying, the burdens that you are carrying are not the burdens of this world. It's not a yoke of sin. It's not a yoke of slavery. It's not a yoke of bondage. Jesus has set you free from that. It's not the, it's not the problems that the world presses on you. It's not that. Because you are a child of God, you have a purpose in life and Jesus is the one who is the integral part of your life. 
But the yoke that he places upon you is not the one that crushes you, but the one that changes you. The yoke that he's placing upon you is not the one that destroys you, but the one that transforms you. You know, all those burdens, all those heavy loads, those pain, those, all that you're carrying, it's going to change you. It's going to work out for his glory in your life. You understand that? It's going to change you. It's going to transform you. That's the beauty of being one with Jesus. That's what he's trying to do in your life and my life. We are not people who are hopeless, who are under a heavy load and we have no clue what's going to happen in your life. No. He has yoked you with him. You understand? You're yoked with Jesus. And it's, it's a journey where we are walking with him. And he's teaching. And that's why he's saying, it's very important for you to learn what I'm doing in your life. Why am I allowing this thing in your life? Take this yoke. It's meant to change you. It's meant to transform you. It meant to perfect you. It meant, it's meant to bring God's glory in your life. That's what God is doing. There was a young man, a spiritual man, you know, who came to a pastor and said, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm struggling with patience. I'm really, I'm finding it very hard. You know what, incidentally, you know, my, my wife was asking, so what, is, what are the prayer points that you've listed, you know, that, you, that you're praying for these 21 days of fast? My personal prayer point, you know. The first, I said, the first point, you want to really know? I said, Lord, give me patience. Give me humility. <laughs> you know, give me gentleness. You know, your midlife crisis after the age of 40, man, it's, you're becoming so impatient for everything in life. I really wrote, that's the first point. Lord, please give me patience. Give me humility. Give me gentleness. Give me kindness. All that I need. That's my first point. Anyway, there was a young boy who came uh, to a pastor and said, Pastor, please, I'm struggling with patience. You know, I'm, I'm not able to have patience. Can you please pray for me? Pastor, yes, very well, I will pray for you. And just laid his hands on him and said, Lord, I pray that you will multiply his sufferings. Give him more problems. He said, Pastor, please hold on. I think you have misheard me. That's not what I meant. You know, I, I, said, I said, I want patience. I'm already struggling with a lot of problems. He said, I want patience. Don't you know what Romans chapter 5 verse says? And we glory in sufferings. And sufferings produce patience. And patience produces character. So I prayed according to God's word. I said God will give you more suffering. So that through the sufferings. Your patience will be developed. It's absolutely biblical right? So why God allows all these problems in your life? You might be thinking, right? You know, even people in the world have problems. Why do we have problems? Now understand this. The problems in the world without Jesus will crush them. But the problems with Jesus, as you're yoked with Jesus, will change you. You're being changed into the very likeness of Christ. So which is better? Which is a better bargain? Which is a better bargain? I would rather be with Jesus. And I will carry the yoke. I will submit myself to what he brings into my life. Because that's changing me. It's working out for his glory. Oh, these sufferings, the problems, the disappointments that we face are just temporal. Just working for us a weight of eternal glory. That's what Jesus is doing in your life and in my life. So take my yoke upon you. So I tell you again, unless you're willing to come under that yoke, unless you're willing to submit yourself and say, Lord, I'm willing to take whatever you have for me. I'm willing to obey whatever your word says. It's, sometimes it's very hard, right? Sometimes it's very hard to do what God expects you to do. You feel it's burdensome. God is burdening me with all. But his Bible says, no, my commandments are not burdensome. He treats you and me like his children. He doesn't give you something which is hard for you to do it. It's easy. It's easy. That's why it says, let's come back to that verse. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You heard about a light burden? Okay, pastor, a burden is a burden. 
How can you say my burden is light? What does it mean? It's an oxymoron. How can it be a light burden? How can a yoke is a yoke? How can it be an easy yoke? How can it be a light burden? No, 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 no. It is a burden. You feel like there is heavy, something heavy on your life. You feel there are things that is weighing you down. But no, but it's light. I've made it so light. It's a light burden because it's meant to change you. It will not crush you. So you understand? So let's take it. That's what the Bible says. So I want to tell you this. Unless, unless you're willing, unless you're willing to take that yoke, you will never learn what God is trying to do in your life. You will never understand what is God's purpose for you. You will never understand what's God's plan in your life. You will never learn the fullness of God's beautiful picture concerning your life. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So read this again. I'm not, I'm not done yet. Whose yoke is that? Take Whose yoke is that? Take my yoke upon you. Whose yoke is that? It's Jesus' yoke. It's his yoke. So why is he yoking us with him? It's not from Satan. It's not from the world. It's Jesus' yoke. It's his own yoke. It's his own, you know, beam that is placing, that he's placing it upon you. Take my yoke. So you look at that image, right? Her two yoke oxen fastened together under one, under one wooden yoke. So Jesus is on one side and you on the other side. And we are yoked together in this journey of life. Jesus is on one side and you are on the other. And he wants to keep us always close to him. You know why he wants to yoke you? Why he wants to fasten you with him? Why you, you, you know, you understand why all those burdens, those struggles, those, those disappointments, the things that weigh you down. And yet, the good news is that he is still close to you. He has yoked himself with you because he wants to always have that proximity and intimacy with you. In spite of all your struggles and challenges and pain and confusion, you get to know that Jesus is still close to you. That's why he has yoked you to him. Because he wants to always keep you close. He doesn't want to take you off the hook. He wants to always keep you close. You will experience that in your life. That he is always close to you. When Evie was in the uh, ICU, you know, it was very hard for her. Uh, um, uh, you know, and uh, every time I had the opportunity, we had... Uh, um, somebody should, somebody could be there with her in the ICU. And uh, there were times that uh, during the nights they said we had to go back and she felt very lonely. Uh, at least one of us would be there in that room. So every time I had the opportunity to sit with her, I will tell her stories. I will tell her stories and stories. I will remember all those stories, you know, I share with you. I've read the stories of the Bible. Every story that will tell her, that will teach her that respect of what goes on in our lives, God is still with us. So I'll tell her, Jesus is in this room. You know, his angels are in this room. You know, maybe Dada, Mama are not there. Maybe in the night you wake up and nobody is there. You know, all that you hear is screaming in the other, you know, uh, rooms or the, or the intensive, you know, patients. I said, but you always remember that, you know, God is with you. Jesus is with you. But it's very hard for her to accept. So sometimes she'll, uh, she might be there, you know, all night alone. And the first thing that when she meets Hepsiba is that she'll cry, you know, I missed you, mama, I missed you. So sometimes I would sit there for hours together. I will tell stories after stories after story that helps us to help her to ease her pain, you know. And, you know, sometimes I was, I was even dehydrated, you know, because I was two hours continuously telling her stories. I'll say, can I have a water break? Chalo, I'll, and I'll continue with my stories. But it's very hard for her to believe or understand that Jesus was still there. You ask why, if, if he was there and if he's here why would I have to go through this pain why do I have to go through this struggle I, I didn't have a perfect convincing answer yesterday she was reading a book you know chicken soup for the soul 
and and then she came running to me dada dada i want to read this story to you and she's always reading books morning also she get a nice firing from epsiba because she's sitting with her book you know and we got delayed so always sitting with her book and always reading so i said what baby i'll i'll talk to you later i'll listen to the no no i want you to listen to the story chicken soup for the soul and she says okay read it and she then she read that story it's about a girl who had who had um, leukemia and i want to read this particular passage for you and she and she said yes read and she and, and this girl talks about how she was taken to the hospital and she said how the doctors begin to poke her he was diagnosed with leukemia and doctors begin to poke her with all those needles you know and uh, like a pin cushion and then she says and then they played a placed a portal on my chest you know to take blood samples and she said so many days i was in the hospital and she was reading to me evie was reading to me so many days i was in the hospital and uh, and one night as i was sleeping in my bed uh, uh, you know with all the pain and suddenly i woke up in the middle of the night and then i saw in my room i saw you know a, a little tiny angel with wings floating near my toy shelf and that girl in that book right so now i knew that jesus was with me and he is taking care of me and he said dada did you read that did you listen to that you know and he said yeah i said do you remember what i told you when you were in the hospital and it seemed like she understood she understood yesterday that in that difficult time because you know all those tubes running all over her body you know and those needles piercing her with all that pain i told her you know respect to all that goes on his angels are there jesus it seemed like she understood us today so in the midst of all those challenging trying moments in our life he still yoked with us because he wants to keep you close to him he wants to keep you close to him so what do we learn from this why he has yoked you with his with him for life number 1 number 1 he will keep us close to him always he will keep us close to him number 2 he doesn't want us to go off the hook because you know you wander off the moment he takes that yoke out of your life the moment he loses that hold over your life you will wander off because that's a human heart condition a human heart will always wander away from god so that's why he keeps the yoke intact that you will always stay close to him but sometimes it bothers you does it sometimes it annoys you you don't want you don't you don't want to do that you feel like you think that jesus is very hard on you you feel all those commandments and all those are are quite legalistic we don't want to do that we just want to break free we want to just do the things our way but you know what i tell you the moment you go off the hook satan takes over the moment you go off the hook we digress away from the path that god has kept for us and that's why he always makes sure that keeps you in the hook the moment you are off that satan comes and snatches us he's always waiting that's why he always keeps you yoked with him number 3 to remind us that is yoke fits us well you know an improper and unsuitable yoke have you seen the animals some of these animals which are carrying this yoke will have a big abscess it's because the yoke is not properly harnessed and placed an improper and unsuitable a yoke with a rough surface will injure jesus yoke fits you so well he knows he has tailor made yokes are just tailor made your problems are just tailor made just for you to change you to transform you to make you the kind of person whom god wants you to be and as you walk with him as you learn this journey with him as you know that what he's trying to do in your life you begin to understand there is beauty that's coming out of ashes you begin to understand there is beauty that's coming out of your character you know that god is changing you and you know my problems are so perfect for my life you know it's tailor made it will not harness you more than what you can bear it won't destroy you you're sitting here this morning and you're wondering you know we've been praying 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 nothing happens in my life god is changing you there's a legend there is an interesting legend which goes like this you know in, in nazareth was a farming village there were many yokes that were made you know because 
the whole main occupation was farming and uh, jesus was a carpenter and he made a lot of yokes he made a lot and you have to bring the animal you have to measure the neck of the animal with the exact measurement with the exact size because the yoke should fit well otherwise it will crush the animal so jesus made all those yokes because he was a carpenter and somebody suggested on his door there would be a sign which would have read like this my yoke fits well so he had the perfect accurate measurement in the way he measured and designed and fastened those yokes his yoke fits well the plans that god has for you are so unique and so special and it fits you well it fits you well and also the problems the struggles that comes into your life it fits you well because that's what is going to change you and make you the kind of person whom god wants you to be so it is to remind us that his yoke fits us well and jesus has yoked us for life to get his character rubbed off on you imagine somebody so perfect somebody so kind somebody so gentle somebody so pure and holy imagine somebody so generous always with you every time he opens his purse and you look you're a stingy guy you doesn't want to you don't want to spend and every time when you're with him he spends what do you'll do at some point of time you know no no da i'll 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 pay for it you know it's changing something is happening you don't want to do it but now you are always with this guy who is always over generous who always over spending he doesn't think twice yeah, and he loves me so much he spends me all the time let me take my purse for once you change right imagine always with somebody who is so pure who is so holy who is so kind who is so patient who is so humble who is so gentle the beauty of his character gets rubbed on you gets rubbed on you that side wants to yoke you with him lot the intimacy that we have with jesus as we grow closer in proximity with him we are changed it gets rubbed on you it has to it has to get rubbed on you the beauty of his character and you begin to learn you begin to learn right So to learn from him take my yoke upon you and learn from me the whole experience is all about learning from Jesus you know what he is doing something very very unique and very specific in your life maybe you don't have all the answers but be patient learn that god is trying to do something so beautiful right so to learn from him to become like him to be changed into his nature to be changed into his likeness but the only ones the only ones who learn are the ones who are willing to take that yoke the only ones who are willing to submit themselves to god totally right so now learning from jesus is a lifelong process you will never get to a place where you say Oh I've learned enough. When Jesus says come to me take your take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He's talking about an experience that we are going to have for the rest of our lives. You're going to learn from Jesus all your life. All your life. So you never get to a place where you would say oh no I've learned enough. Now I'm ready. I'm all set. It will never happen. it will never happen so this is one of the most important things one of the most important things so to keep learning in this life all that god wants to teach us to keep learning because something that god is constantly teaching and trying to do in your life these are such valuable precious lessons which is shaping your future shaping your purpose and to keep learning in this life all that god wants to teach us one must possess a very important quality it's humility you got to be really humble you got to be really humble to learn from jesus what does that says what does the verse says take my yoke upon you and learn 
from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. Is that all Jesus? Is Jesus only gentle and humble? You know, there are so many beautiful character traits of Jesus. He's not just as gentle and humble. But it's a very important quality for us to learn because unless you are humble, you can never learn what God is trying to do in your life. It's one of the most important quality. It's one of the most important quality that Jesus is teaching us. So what is the opposite of humility? Right, it's the very, very core of our being. It's the very core of our being. You know what stops you from learning? Pride. Right. I know it all. It's very hard for us to, it's very hard for us to learn because we are all very proud. Somewhere deep in our hearts. There are areas in our life which are so hard for God to crack. So it becomes very hard for God to teach us. You have to come to a place of humility. It's a Lord. Sometimes God will teach, use people to teach you in your life. Sometimes God will use circumstances to teach you in your life. Sometimes God will use the things that's happening, you know, in your life to make you understand what he's going. Sometimes God will teach you from his word. But God is constantly teaching you. But unless I humble myself and I'm willing to learn, <coughs> you never learn. One of, the most, one of the most difficult things for us to do is to learn. Because somewhere in our hearts, somewhere deep in our being, we have this element of pride. I always talk about myself. Right? I don't know about you, but I have, I have this struggle as well in my life. And I always think, well, when I go wrong, when I do something wrong, who's, who's there to come and tell me, you know, what you're doing is wrong? You won't tell me, apparently, because I'm a pastor. Nobody comes and tells me, right? Would you come and tell me, pastor, what you're doing is wrong? I don't think the way you behaved, the way, the way you spoke, the way you handled this, I don't think so. You will not tell me. Even if I tell you, I beg you, you won't tell me. You know, my, at least my core team members know, I want to be accountable. Please come and tell me when I go wrong. Nobody tells me. Eric, <laughs> good on you, mate. Yes. Nobody tells me because you know what? You some have a, some kind of a respect you have for me that stops you from telling me, right? So in the church, nobody tells me. Harvesters, I have so many pastors working in harvesters. We have close to, you know, 20 pastors working in harvest. None of them come and tell me because I'm doing leadership development for them. I am I'm their leader. I preach, they listen. Right? So nobody listens, nobody comes and tells me. Because I'm the senior most. You know? Pastor Sheridan, oh. So even in the harvesters, I have so many pastors, you know, I work with them, they are part of my life. For 20 years I've been with them. Nobody comes and tells me. In my house, oh, I am the head. I am the head. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands. That is all you have to do in life. Submit. Submit, submit. So your wife has no right to come and tell you when you go wrong, right? Even if she tells you it's, it's a matter of uh, pride, you don't want to She's the last person you want to listen. Right? So, so see how hopeless I am. <laughs> Can you understand my plight? My, nobody, I can't listen to my wife because I am the head of the family. She has to only submit to me. I, I don't, nobody comes and tells me in the church I am the pastor. Even in my whole organization, no pastor comes and tells me. I am in one of the most hopeless situations in life because I don't know whether I'm doing, whether I'm living this life in the right way or am I doing something which is miserably wrong before God. Nobody comes and tells me. You don't want to be in a place like that, do you? No. And when people come and tell you, you know how you react? Man, oh God. You unleash all fury upon them. And ni olunga. The first, the first thing, you know, the first thing somebody comes and tells about us, no? The immediate response will be what they did. You will exactly remember. You won't, even, you won't even fully listen what that person is telling you. Or at least even before you could say, you, that's what you think. That's what you think. It's your mind wise. You won't follow on the term. That's what you think, right? I tell you, people of God, unless we will never learn. I tell you what, we will never learn. I tell you, God's work in your life will be delayed. 
if we don't learn what he's trying to teach us it's very important for you to listen god has a great plans for you great plans for you but the process will be delayed and prolonged if you don't learn and understand what he's actually trying to do in your life with those changing circumstances if you don't understand if you don't discern if you're not sensitive because it's 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 a journey it's a life long learning you will miss out i'll read one verse to you let's read let's read what is it deuteronomy yeah deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 let's turn Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 He humbled you causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God that's a very familiar verse right okay let's read it again He humbled you. Why did he humble you? First place. First first of all, why did God humble the Israelites? Because he's teaching them something. And it's only through humility you will learn. He has to humble you. He has to press that weight hard on you. He has to change your disposition when you are humbled and then you become sensitive that God is doing something. He humbled you causing you to go hungry. He made you hungry. and then feeding you with manna you know the story right he caused them to go hungry and then they all start bickering and murmuring you know? and then he caused them to go thirsty and they all start complaining and murmuring you know? oh, what is this god doing he brought us out of egypt he doesn't give us food on time we like eating non veg he's feeding us why is he where is the water this waters are bitter constantly murmuring but why does he cause them to go hungry and then feed them is he a sadist is god a sadist He wants you to suffer. He wants you to hunger. Then he wants you to thirst. He'll drag you down that hot, scorching wilderness. He doesn't give you food or water, and then you are all sweating and tired and murmuring. And he makes you feel so wretched and makes you, is that is it God like that? What is he trying to do? Why does he withdraw things from you? Because he's trying to teach you something, right? He says, "I made you hungry. I made you thirst. Wait! Don't react. Wait. There's something that I'm trying to tell you." There's something that I'm trying to teach you. What is he trying to teach you? He says, to teach you that, you know what? You don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Isn't that a familiar verse in Matthew 4, 4? He's still teaching us the same thing. Your hunger, all the human wants of life, all that you want, you hunger for so many things. These are human wants. life is not all about satisfying that it's not about all that you need all that you desire hold that for a moment you don't live by that you don't live by finding satisfaction in what the things that you want in life man shall not live by bread alone that's not your only sustenance you live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god you live to listen what god is telling you what he's trying to teach you what is the circumstance that he's taking you through in your life why did i bring you to this wilderness Why do I make you hunger? Why do I make you thirst? There's something that I'm trying to tell you, to humble you, to teach you that God is teaching you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So try to listen to what he's teaching you, what he's telling you. Do you understand? So all that God is trying to do is to teach us. That's why it's very very important for us to be open to learn people of god my god three times they you know, wrong i you know so the thing is god is telling us again and again so you come to that place where you are yoked with jesus and you learn from him it's an invitation to take his yoke upon you so it's a life of learning from jesus and pray that god will give us the humility to learn you know 
There's so much that we don't know and we have a long life ahead. You'll never get to a place where you can say, I know this too well. It's a whole life of walking and learning with Jesus. And where he transforms us, he transforms us to be his, to be one with him. Right, so the theme of my message, this is where we end. God has great plans for us. A life is not a hundred meter dash. It's a marathon, right? We need to learn a lot of things as we walk in this journey with God. God has great plans for us. He wants to change you before he blesses you, right? He's constantly trying to change us. Even in this 21 days of fasting, you know, there are a lot of things that we're expecting from God, but there is a subtle expectation from God concerning our lives. He wants us to change. God has great plans for us. He wants to bless us before he bless. He wants to change us before he blesses us. But the only condition for that is, are you willing to take his yoke? Are you willing to submit yourself? Are you willing to yield yourself completely to what God is placing on you? It's a journey of a lifetime. It's a journey where Jesus is willing to walk with us. He's yoked us with him. And it's a life of intimacy. It's a life of proximity. It's a life that we are with him together. It's a partnership that Jesus has made. So there's nothing to fear. But in this journey, there's one thing that we are learning. We are learning to just walk in his ways. We are learning to find out what pleases him. We are learning to change, to be changed into his very nature. To be like him. To be one with him. To be united with Jesus, to be united with his heart, to be united with his will, to be united with his purpose, to be united one with Jesus. Can we just close our eyes and pray? Father, we just want to thank you, Lord. We thank you for this invitation. Lord, you are inviting us to be united with you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Lord, we are in a place, a constant place of learning and changing. We are in this journey of life where God is constantly working and changing us. There are many things in our life we may not know the answers. There are many things in our life, Lord, we do not know. Sometimes we feel the burden Sometimes we feel the pressure weighing on us. But today we know it's the yoke that changes us. We are willing to take that yoke. We are willing to submit ourselves to your plans in our lives, oh God. We are willing to submit. We are willing to learn. We are willing to yield ourselves, Lord. Are you willing to yield yourself? Are you willing to let go of yourself to Jesus? Don't go off that hook. Because I tell you, it is, it's blessed to be yoked with him, united with him. Because he's making something so beautiful out of our lives. We are united with Jesus, with one heart, with one spirit, with for one purpose. So Lord, I pray this morning, I pray for each and every one of us. Let us be one with you, Lord. Let's be one with you. We want to walk this journey with you, Lord Jesus. We want to walk this journey with you. We know that this is a process to change us, to make us more and more like you. Like you. I pray that you'll perfect that work in us. I know that your yoke fits us so well. Your plans are so unique and purposeful in our lives. I know, Lord Jesus, you're working it so beautifully in our lives, Master. And I pray that you'll do it so perfectly that we will be changed to accomplish your purpose in our life. Let's commit your children into your hands. We want to give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now until Jesus comes again. Amen.